If not, thank you once again, and we will go on. And now we are going to um, England, and I invite Kent uh, Rawlison from Hampton uh, Court to speak to Tudor Palaces. And as I think everybody else has been saying, it's just a huge pleasure to be here. Thank you. So thank you ever so much for having me. And also just to say that I could easily double the length of my paper by um, making reference to all the parallels that have been coming up. Um, I'm concerned that there's absolutely nothing original about Tudor palaces whatsoever. Um, so I'll try not to make too many asides and let you draw your own parallels and conclusions. Successful royal dynasties often result from politically expedient marriages. In England, such a marriage occurred in 1486 when Henry VII married Princess Elizabeth of York. They both appear here with their seven children in a portrait of around 1505. Here and here. In August 1485, Henry, sometimes known by his family name as Henry Tudor, had defeated and killed Elizabeth's uncle, King Richard III, at the Battle of Bosworth. Their marriage united two rival royal dynasties, the houses of Lancaster and York, and it ended an intermittent but often brutal civil war that had, um, for the English throne that had lasted for almost 30 years. Henry and Elizabeth, their children and grandchildren, are now commonly known as the Tudor dynasty, and the so-called Tudor period in English history is in essence a long 16th century that begins with Henry's seizure of the throne in 1485 and ends with the death of his granddaughter Elizabeth I in 1603. Following a generation of civil war, Henry VII and his son Henry VIII sought first to re-establish royal power within England and second to increase the political and cultural standing of England with respect to its neighbours, in particular France and the Holy Roman Empire. The building and rebuilding of royal houses and palaces contributed to both endeavours. Henry VII acquired approximately 15 royal houses in 1545 and added another five over the course of his reign. Henry VIII, who succeeded his father in 1509, dramatically increased the size of the royal estate to a total of approximately 70 houses and palaces by the time of his own death in 1547. Um, Henry's architectural estate is mapped here, um, concentrating on the southeast of England, and this is the largest architectural estate maintained by any English king before or since. Henry's new houses and palaces were acquired by the purchase of, um, or seizure of existing properties, um, taking them from noblemen, churchmen, and courtiers, by the, perch, um, by the conversion of monasteries into royal houses following their enforced closure or dissolution, and occasionally, but only very, very occasionally, by the construction of houses entirely anew. Henry VIII possessed a great personal enthusiasm for architecture. In fact, later in his reign, um, sorry, later in his daughter Elizabeth I's reign, he's described as being no less than a Hadrian or a Justinian in his um, passion for architecture. However, his acquisition of buildings was also, it seems, a deliberate means of exercising royal authority vis-a-vis -vis individual courtiers and noblemen, and of exercising royal power within particular regions of his realm. Henry VIII's three children each succeeded him in turn as King Edward the sixth as Mary I and as Elizabeth I. However, none appears to have possessed such a personal interest in architecture and none of their reigns um, saw any royal building of any consequence, a complete contrast to what we were just seeing at the Louvre. Many of the medium-sized and smaller houses acquired by their father were granted or sold off to leading courtiers, some returning simply to their former owners. Um, others simply fell into disuse. Ironically, Whereas Henry VIII had bolstered and built up his royal authority by expanding the royal estate, his heirs in turn exercised patronage and influence by its managed reduction. The Tudor period might therefore be simply summarised as one that witnessed the dramatic renewal and expansion of the royal estate, followed by the inevitable onset of redundancy and physical decay. What this overview would, dis would, dis 
disguise, however, is that a small group of particularly large and magnificently appointed royal houses existed and was continually maintained at the heart of this wider royal estate. The Venetian secretary in England in 1603 commented on these greater houses. Quote, The court passed on to Hampton Court, which is shown here in this slide, um, which is far larger than the seven other palaces belonging to the crown. All eight of them lie on the banks of the Thames. They say that Hampton Court has 1,800 inhabitable rooms. The furnishings are the richest the crown possesses. Each of the palaces has its own furniture, which is never taken to furnish another. It is these great royal houses that are best understood as Tudor palaces in our present context, and although their number varied from time to time, central to this group were five palaces substantially built or rebuilt by Henry VII and Henry VIII. Um, Greenwich Palace here, just off the map, Whitehall Palace in central London, Richmond Hampton Court that you just saw, and to a certain extent, Windsor Castle. Each of these was situated, as you can see, on the banks of the River Thames, which facilitated transport between them, and each of them was large enough to accommodate the entire royal court and its guests. These palaces served as the core of the Tudor royal estate. Although the monarch and their entourage still moved in the traditional itinerant manner between other royal, noble, and religious properties, um, especially over the course of the summer, it was always to these greater houses that they returned. They did so in particular on occasions when the royal court needed to expand to its fullest extent of up to 1,500 people. For instance, to observe major religious feasts, to host state and diplomatic visits by foreign rulers or their embassies, and to celebrate royal rites of passage including coronations, marriages and baptisms. For the remainder of this paper, I shall concentrate upon just one of these great royal houses, Richmond, indicated here. Richmond was the first palace to be rebuilt by Henry VII following, following the destruction of its predecessor by fire in 1497. Only a few partial fragments remain, such as this gatehouse. Richmond is, however, described or recorded in two remarkable contemporary sources. First, its external appearance is recorded in detailed drawings and sketches made by the Dutchman Antonius van den Wingarder for Philip II of Spain between 1558 and 1562. Um, this is an example of one of those sketches. Secondly, the palace is described at length in an account of the marriage of Henry VII's eldest son, Prince Arthur, to Catherine of Aragon in 1501. This account was composed by an anonymous royal official in 1502-3 and is known as the receipt or the reception of the Lady Catherine. So it, this is being composed just as the palace is being finished and completed. Its ninth chapter is entitled, quote, Of the hunting in the King's Park and of the description of the Palace of Richmond. A modern English version of the text is given in your handouts together with a basic plan of the palace. Um, please don't worry if you don't have the hands out, handouts, you don't need those to follow what I'm going to be saying. The description of Richmond promises to recount its great, quote, great commodities, pleasures, and excellent goodliness. And it is remarkable both as a contemporary account of a royal palace and also as a self-conscious attempt to employ literary description of architecture as a means of royal propaganda or image-making. It constitutes a carefully constructed literary description or virtual tour of all the key elements and functions of the palace, which I will attempt to summarise and illustrate for the remainder of this paper. To begin with, the description of Richmond presents the palace as an architectural paradigm. Quote, This earthly and second paradise of our region of England and of all the great part and circuit of the world the bright spectacle and beauteous exemplar of all proper lodgings. This grand claim is followed by a description of the palace's topographical setting. Quote, Set between high and pleasant mountains in a valley and goodly fields where the, most, where the most wholesome eries and lees open their course, it is founded and erected upon the Thames side, eight miles beyond the noble city of London. The palace is thus presented as a man-made marvel set within the natural bounty of England's fertile landscape, neighbouring areas of which were maintained as royal parkland for hunting. 
In addition, the crucial relationship with the River Thames is emphasised, and this is a late 16th century drawing that depicts um, a noble entourage arriving at Whitehall Palace by river. Richmond is broadly described as, quote, quadrant and four square, which neatly um, summarises the division of Tudor palaces into a series of linked courtyards, beginning with the largest, most public and least formal, and ending with the smallest, most private and most richly furnished. Um, the three courtyards at Alanya that we heard about yesterday are obviously now springing into your minds. Um, Richmond had just such a succession of three courtyards, the outer courtyard, the inner courtyard, and the royal lodgings. The architectural description proper opens with the northern land-facing approach, which is sketched here by Wingard. This is described as, quote, a strong and mighty brick wall of great length and curious fashion, goodly barred and set with towers in each corner and also in the middle of many steps and stages of height. This passage draws attention to the, dr the dramatic use of red brick, a fashionable and, in England at this time, a very modern building material. Um, and it also emphasises the imposing character of the building, which, although not conceived as a fortress, was nevertheless intended to protect the court and its guests and to convey, to convey an impression of physical strength. This, is, this emphasis is accentuated by a detailed description of the, quote, strong gates of double timber and heart of oak, struck through with nails right thick, and crossed with bars of iron. And these are the gates still surviving at Hampton Court of 1536, and they're struck through with nails in a decorative pattern throughout and made of solid English oak. The description of Richmond takes us on into the palace itself. Quote, Within these rehearsed gates, there is a fair, large, and broad courtyard. This was the outer court, as shown here by Wingard, which was the largest courtyard within the palace, and as such, required a carefully designed drainage system. Not all large courtyards require this, but if you have a large courtyard in England, you need a carefully designed drainage system. Um, it was, quote, raised and banked in the middle for the rainwater, having channels for it to flow, keeping it always from soil and foulness. Around the sides of this courtyard were, quote, galleries with many windows, large and well lit. Out of these galleries, there were many doors and entrances into pleasant chambers, hostelries and lodgings. At Richmond and elsewhere, such as here at Hampton Court, um, the lodgings in these outer courts were for guests, quote, for such lords and men of honour that wait upon the king's grace, both foreigners and his own liege people and subjects. On the far side of the outer court and entered through its own gatehouse was, quote, a lesser curtilage paved with freestone or marble. This was the inner court whose centrepiece was, quote, a fountain and cistern of stone. Um, unfortunately, no view of this fountain survives, although you just see the fountain peeking out the top there um, over the battlement. Um, However, this is another sketch by Wingard of a similarly extravagant ornamental fountain constructed later for Henry VIII within the inner court at Hampton Court. The description of Richmond praises the plumbing of the fountain there as, quote, craftily made with goodly cocks and springs, which at the will of those who draw water open and close again. And it details its rich heraldic decoration, quote, there were lions and red dragons and other goodly beasts, and certain branches of red roses, out of which is ever more running the most pure water. However, we are also reminded of the fountain's practical purpose, to serve those, quote, in the chambers with water for their hands and all other offices. Dominating either side of the inner court were the two most important buildings within the palace, the great hall and the chapel. Um, the hall on this side and the chapel here mirroring it on the other. The Pleasant Hall was the palace's largest room and by tradition the space where the court and its guests gathered to participate in formal ceremony, in extravagant feasts and in spectacular theatrical and musical entertainment. The description of Richmond recounts the rich decoration of the hall. Quote, Paved with goodly tiles, whose roof is made of timber, properly constructed, craftily carved, and joined together with mortises and pins, 
hanging pendants from the roof above the ground and floor after the most new invention in craft of the pure practice of geometry. This is the Great Hall at Hampton Court, constructed in the early 1530s, which is likewise dominated by its spectacular timber ceiling. The description of Richmond dwells in turn upon the hall's iconographic programme. Quote, Between the windows be pictures of the noble kings of this realm in their armour and robes of gold, with their swords in their hands, like bold and valiant knights. Similar sequences of English kings decorated earlier royal halls, most notably that at Westminster Palace, while these two early 16th century panel paintings of English kings probably originate from another Tudor royal hall. Significantly and unusually, the kings at Richmond were depicted as armed knights, quote, so their deeds and acts and chronicles be right evidently shown and declared. And so they probably, represent, um, they probably recalled um, this wonderful image of Henry VIII wearing golden armour painted around 1535. These martial portraits were complemented by rich tapestries which hung beneath them, quote, representing many noble battles and sieges as of Troy and Jerusalem. Significantly, this royal program of English, or sorry, self-evidently, um, this program of English warrior kings was intended to reinforce Henry VII's the, Henry the legitimacy as a ruler, in particular as one who had seized the throne in battle. What is remarkable, however, is that the author of the description of Richmond explicitly comments on this purpose. Quote, In the higher part is the seemly picture of our most excellent sovereign now reigning upon us, King Henry VII, who is as worthy of that situation and place with those glorious princes. So he's as worthy to have this picture as anybody else that you see um, decorating the hall as any king that ever reigned in this land who with his great manhood and wisdom has continued to reign nobly and victoriously. On the other side of the inner court and architecturally balancing the great hall was the chapel. This was as if not more richly decorated, uh, being, quote, well paved, glazed and hung with cloth of arras, the body and choir with cloth of gold and the altars set with many relics, jewels and full rich plate. This is the magnificently decorated ceiling of the Chapel Royal at Hampton Court installed for Henry VIII in 1535-6. The chapel's decorative programme complemented that of the hall very deliberately. The walls were again decorated with images of English kings, but here with those, quote, whose life and virtue were so abundant that it has pleased Almighty God to show through them many miracles and who were thereby regarded as saints. These royal saints included Edward the Confessor, King Cadwallader, and St. Edmund. And this is a mutilated statue of Edward the Confessor from the gilt bronze screen of Henry VII's tomb manufactured only a few years later. The inclusion of Cadwallader, an obscure and distant Welsh ancestor of the Tudors, indicates that this scheme sought to emphasise Henry VII's own personal relationship to this family of royal saints, as well as more generally to celebrate the exemplary piety of England's monarchs. Attention is drawn to Henry, VIII's, sorry, Henry VII's own piety by a detailed description of his private pew or closet. Quote, Richly hung with silk and a traverse, which is a canopy, um, carpet and cushions. This print shows Henry's granddaughter, Elizabeth I, praying in a similarly appointed closet. Henry's private altar was, quote, set with plate and rich relics of gold and precious stones, and we're reminded yesterday of hearing about the royal relic of royal relic collections. Its ceiling was, quote, white-limed and checkered with timber, lozenge-wise, and painted the colour as colour of azure. And it was decorated with royal badges, quote, within every checker a red rose, um, or a, 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 sorry, within every checker um, a red rose of gold or a port colours. And these are badges surviving from Hampton Court. And again, you see golden red roses and golden portcullises. The religious ceremonies performed in royal chapels defined much of the character of the Tudor court. It was to celebrate major religious feasts that the court gathered in the greater palaces at different times throughout the year. It was in royal chapels, large and small, that the daily and weekly rounds of service were performed, 
and it was in royal chapels that many of the royal rites of passage and other liturgical ceremonies, such as the confirmation of diplomatic treaties, were solemnly performed. The monarch and their family um, were, as a rule, the principal participants in these liturgical celebrations, which were, in turn, publicly witnessed by the court and its guests. The description of Richmond describes how the chapel incorporated pews or closets, quote, for the Queen's grace, the prince's, the lady the king's mother, and for other estates, that's noblemen, and for gentlewomen. These designs for stained glass window, drawn around 1525, depict Henry VIII, Queen Catherine of Aragon, and their daughter, Princess Mary, together at prayer in such a royal pew. Linking the Great Hall and the chapel, and both in turn with the royal lodgings, were a series of, quote, goodly passages and galleries. Um, and as we saw yesterday at the Lateran, and we've heard about repeatedly over the last few days, um, these galleries were, an important, um, these were important ceremonial spaces in their own right, used for procession. The description of Richmond reports how these two were, quote, paved, glazed, and well-appointed, decorated with badges of gold, such as roses, portcullises, and others. This illumination of 1535 shows Henry VIII here on the far left in a grand liturgical procession um, going from the royal apartments to the chapel at Windsor Castle through an amazingly decorated royal gallery with royal badges on the ceiling. The royal lodgings themselves stood behind the inner court and faced directly onto the River Thames. First came, quote, the king's chambers, the first, second, and third, all richly hung um, with costly cloths of arras, sealed, white-limed, and chequered. This is just such a ceiling belonging to the great watching chamber at Hampton Court Palace, constructed around 1536. These chambers had, quote, goodly bay windows glazed and set out, probably similar to these which light another series of royal apartments also built for Henry VII at Windsor Castle. At Richmond, the great block of royal lodgings, um, seen here from the riverside, included, quote, many more goodly chambers for the Queen's grace, the prince and princesses, my lady, the king's mother, the Duke of York, which is the future Henry VIII, and all the king's noble kindred and progeny. The emphasis is no longer on public display, but instead on private luxury. The rooms described here include, quote, pleasant dancing chambers and secret closets, most richly hung and decorated. This is a very, very rare example of such a private chamber or closet that survives, albeit much restored, at Hampton Court Palace. Servicing the palace's lodgings and state apartments required a large, well-staffed and, um, and carefully managed complex of service buildings known in the 16th century as houses of office. These are glimpsed here in one of Wingard's sketches. So this is the kitchen just here and all the other buildings associated with it. The wise management of a household was considered to be a preeminent lordly and by extension royal virtue. The description of Richmond takes care to describe how, quote, under and beside the great hall are set out the houses of office, the pantry, the buttery, the cellars, the kitchen and the scullery and it also praises their planning and operation as, quote, wise and right politically conveyed. This is the largest of a substantial complex of kitchens and offices that still survive at Hampton Court. On the other side of the palace, quote, under the king's windows, and so we're reminded that these are much, as much to be seen from the royal apartments as to be um, enjoyed for themselves, um, are the most fair and pleasant gardens with royal knots laid and herbed, um, and these gardens are sort of sketched out briefly um, in this drawing by Wingard. Set amongst the beds and the planting were tall lines of heraldic beasts standing on painted posts. Quote, many marvellous beasts as lions, dragons, and others of diverse kinds properly fashioned and carved. A similar, guard, um, a similar gu royal garden at Whitehall Palace is shown in this drawing uh, made sorry, painting made right at the end of Henry's reign, and you see these royal beasts standing on posts. Um, and just thinking about the chevroning um, that Scott was talking about yesterday, everywhere in Tudor palaces you find simple white and green um, chevroning um, because white and green were the Tudor royal heraldic colours. Uh, 
Such gardens evoke descriptions and illustrations of their counterparts in chivalric and courtry, courtly literature, as wonderfully imagined here. In addition, Richmond, like other Tudor palaces, possessed a tilt yard for the staging of rich heraldic tournaments, as well as a complex of other recreational buildings. Quote, in the lower end of this garden are pleasant galleries and houses of pleasure to play in at chess, tables, dice, cards, bowls, bowling alleys, butts for archers, and goodly tennis plays. Um, here, Wingard shows the bowling, one of the three bowling alleys at Hampton Court here, um, set at the bottom um, of the royal gardens with these other sort of pleasure pavilions and galleries and walkways all looking out over the river. To conclude then, the description of Richmond provides not only a remarkable contemporary account of a Tudor palace, but also an even rarer contemporary commentary upon the cultural and political significance of such a building. Its very composition is evidence of the self-conscious manner in which royal workmen and writers sought to employ royal buildings, as well as literary descriptions of them as a means of political and cultural influence. If we take the description of Richmond at face value as a record, um, albeit cautiously, since it's obviously so much more than that, it's an imagined building as well as a real building, um, then these basic functions of a palace, um, or those that it chooses to emphasise, are threefold. Firstly, a palace was a place of reception, lodging and entertainment for those visiting the royal court, both members of the English nobility and foreign ambassadors and embassies. These guests were lodged in the outer court, they participated in feast ceremonies and services in the great hall and the chapel, and they were provided with numerous other means of recreation in the form of gardens, sporting facilities, hunting and tournaments. Secondly, a palace was a place or a means of promoting royal legitimacy and authority. This was achieved through displays of material wealth and of architectural and artistic set pieces produced by skilled royal craftsmen. The palace was in turn decorated with carefully composed iconographic programmes and with an abundance of heraldic devices. While the wealth of the monarch was demonstrated on a daily basis by the sheer scale and sophistication of the operation undertaken by the royal household to service the court and its guests. Thirdly, and one might argue um, least significantly, um, a palace provided luxurious accommodation for the monarch and their family. The royal apartments at Westminster Palace in 1538 were described as, quote, beautiful, costly and pleasant lodgings for his grace's singular comfort and pleasure. In the context of this present conference, these palatial functions, courtly entertainment, cultural and political display and royal accommodation are neither surprising nor original. Um, but I hope that is our wider point, that royal palaces functioned in a broadly consistent manner from period to period and from place to place. In the context of 16th century England, however, it is remarkable how deliberately and how self-consciously England's Tudor monarchs built, rebuilt and maintained a sequence of modern palaces at Richmond, Greenwich, Hampton Court and Whitehall royal estate long after the death of Elizabeth I in 1603. To employ an English idiom, these palaces were, quote, fit for a king. Or, to quote a description of Hampton Court in 1539, each was, quote, a goodly and sumptuous house, a beautiful and princely manor, meet and convenient for a king. Thank you.